Went to go knock at his house. It was like, Are you okay? Like, are you alive? Mm-hmm. You know? And he finally reached out, but he's ignoring everyone else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, except my boss. But I'm like, Well, at least you're reaching out, so it's okay, Zane. Yeah. Which is good. I hope it's alright. Yeah. All right, I think we finally got going, and we got the, I think we've got video. So I uh, keep my fingers crossed and hope that it uh, is recording and we don't run out of space and that sound gets picked up and I don't trip over the cord and kill myself. So all of those things should uh, add up uh, positively, I think. I'm getting the uh, projector on. We are going to continue our conversations that we started last class about temperament types. Uh, we took the test, and you got the cheat sheet and the handout to take home and uh, could have reviewed. We're going to review more in class today because there's some super important things that I think we can benefit out of this once we uh, grasp the, the principles and the concepts. And we, we've uh, scored ourselves for one test, one day, 70 questions. And of those, we have, we have decided that we have four letters that represent potentially who we were at that moment in time anyway, at least partly. Understanding that none of us are, are pure, uh, hardcore, one of anything. We, we, we have a tendency 
to be hardwired in those directions, but we have the, the freedom to choose what we want, to act how we want, to, to make whatever uh, plans that may be not consistent with our temperament wiring uh, if we want to do that. And so we, we understand them to be a, a clue as to what to expect from people if we read their temperament, we know a little bit about their temperament. It becomes a helpful thing in order to be able to connect with them better. In my case, I want to be able to speak the language of other people that, that I am making proposals to or making recommendations to or I'm trying to influence in some way. Uh, maybe get my way, maybe sell them something, maybe, maybe uh, see something the way I see it. And I want to try to get that across. And, and what we learn is that we often don't get that across because we often don't speak the correct language. I've got a pop-up here that tells me I've got a scan result that I don't think we need on our, our video copy, but I don't know how to quite get it off. So now hopefully it just will go away. Hopefully it's not picked up, or if it is, it's hopefully out of, out of the picture. Uh, anyway, we, we took the test, drew some conclusions about ourselves, talked a little bit, but we didn't talk much. I want us to, uh, to extend that conversation, and you can, you can remind yourself of, of how you scored by looking at the board here if you'd like to. And, and I'm going to review and talk just a little bit about these four uh, data points that we're collecting information on. First of all, the extrovert versus introvert. I think we're pretty familiar with that. We, we run into that a lot in our world. We use those words, uh, those terms, and so that's not much of a news flash to us, except for perhaps we thought one was good and one was bad, and that's not the case at all. And perhaps we thought that it was the way people were because that's the way they wanted to be instead of seeing this is where people get their energy from. This is the energy source. And so for extroverts, extroverts gather their en energy from outside and introverts gather their en energy from deep internally. Two completely different places. So if we understand that quiet spot for the introvert, that's the, that's the recharging port. For the extrovert, that is the decharging port. If we force an extrovert to, to solitary and, and go sit in your room and, and don't turn on the TV or computer and just think about what you did, uh, we, we're not energizing them. Uh, we're de-energizing the extrovert. Extrovert gets their energy from go out and play. Uh, go out and interact with your friends and your buddies, and that's where energy comes from. And so those are two completely different places. And having that understanding helps, I think, quite a bit in, in uh, being able to make connections. Where we get our information from, the sensor versus the intuitive, those names, we, we're at least familiar with what the names mean, but we might be misled a little bit by it. Intuitive uh, sometimes is referred to as somebody that just bases their world on, on raw intuition. And some people look at that as voodoo science. And, and that's not what it's meant here at all. It's the kind of information that the intuitive person brings in. It's, it's relationship connection and harmonization. That's what, they're, that's what they're, they're putting the pieces together to add up to a sum or a whole, where the sensors are just gathering data points as it's being reported. Ones and zeros, black and white. What does the sensor say? Uh, I heard it, that's the sensor. Our, our ears, our eyes, if I see it, I believe it. If I hear it, I believe it. If I taste it, I believe it. If I touch it, I believe it. But the intuitives don't need those sensors uh, or that sensory feedback in order for them to, uh, to categorize something as valuable information. So those are two different in information sources as well uh, as the 
two different energizing places. And then the types of information that we predicate our decision making on, thinkers or feelers, and, and that, that is a little misleading because it, 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 some people look at touchy-feely as bad. Men especially tend to, to uh, scoff at someone uh, who's, who's connected to their emotions, and, and that's not what this is about at all. This is about basing a decision on logical facts that we add up or emotional conclusions that take a lot more data points into play. Like, for example, we have, we have finally learned that there are lots of kinds of intelligences, and one of them we label as IQ. And most of us, without us knowing it, were given IQ tests to see if we're dumber than a rock, or maybe we can inter interact with people in our class. And they started giving us those tests when we were in grade school. And it's somewhat unfortunate because we categorized and stratified people based on, on one form of a test result that was administered in one very specific way. And, and it wasn't a broad type of assessment because uh, as, as you know, uh, we have different people that have different types of intelligences. This isn't a class about that, but it's a reminder that we know that. And so uh, physical intelligence are the people that, that have a uncanny awareness of where their body is. Uh, they can stand on the top limb of the tree that will support them and kind of make a hop down to another one that will support them and land it with balance. They can get on a skateboard and have a, 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 a natural way of positioning their body so that the board will respond. There are others that struggle with that. They never get that quite figured out in their head that if I go backwards, the board goes up. You know, the, the, this, this, this mass distribution, the physics of that is an intuitive thing to many people. Uh, I don't have as much of that. I played sports, but I had to try harder. The people that have natural wiring at that don't have to try. They naturally catch a ball. They naturally throw a ball. Uh, I go through a doorway and I hit the door jam half the time. I've, I've miscalculated the width of the door or width miscalculated my width. It's probably more like it. My whiskers don't stick out far enough uh, or whatever it is. I don't have that natural awareness of where my body is exactly. And it's readily apparent on the dance floor. It's readily apparent in certain other activities that we do. And you, you know the people that are just wired. And if you gave them a pair of tap shoes with no instruction, in 10 minutes they'd be tap dancing. You know the people that are wired that way. And, and, and that's a physical intelligence that we don't have even a good name for it. But, it, it, but, it's, a, it, but it's a certainly a thing. We have a name for emotional intelligence but we don't teach it very much. We don't talk it very much. There's great value in it. We have some people that are hardwired, intelligently emotional. And, and they, they have the ability to sense and pick up emotional forces, positive, negative, uh, the things that come into play in our world. They can tell when we're emotionally troubled. They see, some of them even talk about they don't know how to describe it. They, they, they call it an aura or something. And, it, and it's, not, it's not that. It's, the, it's they have an innate ability to look at another human being and see beyond their face and see into something that's reflecting emotions. They can tell if we're troubled, if we are, if we are concerned, we're worried or angry and are, are in love. They can tell all of those things. And, and they do it without thinking and they do it without... Uh, un understanding exactly what all that is. And so some of these things draw some of those intelligences, and we have more. We have musical intelligence. You can't, there's, there, there's something about some parts of music that you really can't teach. It's people sit down, Mozart at a piano before he was six, and, 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 and just knew how to play it. And, and, and it, it's, it's un, undescribable. Where did that come from, that, that, that musical knowledge of, 
of intonation and chord progressions and, and what is a proper sequence and what's an improper sequence. And, and the people that are musically talented and gifted have that, which is very closely associated with the gift of math, which is another gift, right? That's not raw intelligence. It's an understanding of theoretical relationships. And, and uh, some people have it and most of us do not. And so we draw from some of those things with these, though. And the T and F is an example. The thinkers are drawing from the logical ability to look at cause and effect on a Rubik's Cube and without touching it can figure out how to make the orange spot appear on the other surface. They look at it. It makes sense to them. It logically works in their brain. They see these moves and it, they don't understand why I struggle with it. But, but we can learn it. All of us that are not gifted in that way can learn it. But there are some that are pegged 20 to 0 in the thinker. And they'll look at that Rubik's Cube and figure out how to solve it. Uh, the feelers, not so much. But the feelers will look at uh, the dynamics in a group at, 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 the, at the city council meeting and will figure out how to tip through, through that, doubt, that balance of, of human raw emotion that's, that's going to tear the town up at the city council meeting and they'll somehow be able to put all the pieces together in a way that will create unity and advancement. That's the decision makers that are understanding the emotional cause and effect of uh, what's going on in a room. And we all have bits and pieces and, and strengths and weaknesses in, in these things. And finally, the judges and perceivers are both named badly because that's not really what it's about. The, the making decisions is based on judgment uh, more than how we organize our world. Judging and perceiving is an unfortunate term that we will talk about a little bit as to where the terms came from. But what it really does mean is our comfort with the level of organization that we are living around and living with. And we're going to see great difference on this one. We talked a tiny bit about it in class, and we've got a high number of judges in this room. Uh, Lauren and I are the only two that aren't. The rest of you, it's us against you on the J and the P. And uh, we will talk about what a, a significant difference that is in the way we uh, do things. In this room, uh, it's, uh, in the real population, it's 50-50. Half the people alive are J and half the people alive are P. In this room, and not so, uh, there's a lot more J's in this room than there are P's. And in corporate management in general, I will put it out there, there are a lot more J's than there are P's. And for those of us that are P's and find ourselves in corporate management, we have uh, some things that are working against us and things that we have to accommodate uh, or, or uh, the handicaps that we have to work our way through. I'll talk to uh, us all about them a little bit as we dive into this a little bit more, which I, I want to do uh, next. We, I've lost my flip -a jig Here it is. Uh, so I passed out before class the Homer Simpson view. And, and as we look at something like a leader, you know, here's an example of lots of different ways you can lead. These are all viable leadership things. We have the visionary leader. We have the leader that is the process-oriented, that, that uh, uh, drives the, the, the organization through strict process. We have the, the, the uh, difference settler by compromise. That's a leadership form. We have the you know, command and control. We have the, the rah-rah a trophy for you guys. Uh, we have this person that repeats whatever they think is the, the, uh, the leadership tip du jour, you know, and, and, and sometimes they're awesome and sometimes they're not. And we have the leaders that are just full of hot air uh, that, and we know who they are. They they're usually didn't earn their leadership, but they are given the leadership. And then we've got the coaching uh, leader, and there's probably a lot more besides that. We can look at leadership uh, within the framework of these temperaments and draw some conclusions from it. But let's just review what we got so far. The communication piece 
really is what has to do with the introvert extrovert. The information piece, it was, has to do with the sensor or the intuitive. The deciding piece has to do with thinker feeler and the control piece has to do with judge or perceiver. Now that makes a little more sense. When we put control in the descriptor there, we see why J's are often uh, more in control. Uh, in their leadership roles, and the P's, it looks like to us, the wheels are coming off <laughs> at some points in time. Uh, we'll laugh about it a little bit together as we look at that. But let's pause for a second and dissect the E's and the I's, and let's uh, learn a couple things about them separately. Not the combination of our four letters together, but separately, the E and the I. In this room, we have one person that is halfway between an E and an I, which means their score on this EI test was five and five. For all of the rest of us, it was something different. Uh, we could have been uh, 10 zero, we could have been nine one, eight two, seven three, six four, or Ivan's five five. So those are our possible combinations which say kind of how far towards the wall, if I had us all stand up in this room, and I won't do that, but if I had us all stand up, and the E's go to that side, and the I's go to this side, and you kind of look at where you're at, the X gets to stand in exactly the middle, and the rest of us are drifting somewhere, uh, maybe we're at the wall, but maybe we're, we're one or two steps off the wall towards the other side. So we're a blend, is what I'm saying. So none of us usually are a pure E, or a pure eye. But when we look at, this, at the characteristics, first of all, the population 75% E. So right off the bat, eyes are rarer than E's. But in this room, not the case. We have three eyes and a half. And we have two and a half E's. That is not 75% E. Because <coughs> in Corporate management, uh, eyes have a strong place and strong opportunity. And they rise to the top quite often. Uh, we will talk about that a little bit more. The I uh, and E are different in a lot of ways. The E's tend to be social. If we looked at the numbers on Facebook that the E's are connected to, it usually will be a lot higher than the I's are connected to because the eyes don't care. They, they, they don't care if they're socially involved or interacted or not. The pure eyes don't. Uh, the pure eyes care more about territory. So the eye is naturally wired to be territorially protective. We have some eyes in the room that could confirm that potentially. The E's tend to be, it, it, you know, social. It's out there. Uh, the E's are interacting. Uh, the, it, the energy comes from external stuff. The subject is, how broad is this subject? And the E's tend to know a lot about a lot of subjects because they're interested in a lot of subjects. And, but they usually don't know a lot about any one of them. <laughs> At least in my own case, that, that's the case. We know a lot about a lot of things and, and, and we know deeply very few things. And the I knows some things incredibly deeply. Instead of the breadth, the I is interested in the depth how deep can they dive and go and learn a subject or a topic and become an authority? And when an eye pops up with information, you almost ought to go to the bank with it because they know deeply uh, about that topic. It's not just casual uh, anecdotal information usually. It's something that, that, that they've got quite a depth of understanding about. Uh, and and that's, that's cool. Ease are looking at how extensive is a topic, a subject, a product line, a, a competitive line. Uh, the eyes are looking at intensity. How dominant are we? How, how, how controlling are we in this marketplace? Uh, how, how, how much do we own it? Uh, the eyes are looking at multiple relationships. The eyes are limiting their relationships to one that, that means something. Uh, they're, they're, the, eye, the E's look at superficial relationships. The eyes look at deep, meaningful relationships. Uh, in general, that, that, that's a natural tendency. The E's are burning energy. Run, 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 run. Uh, go, 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 go. This is an E thing. 
you know, I'll sleep if I ever have to, you know, just keep going. And the I is going, hang on a second here, let's convert, conserve our energy because you never know when you're going to need it. And I want to have it in the tank uh, when we need it. And so I'm going to be there for the team when, it, when chips are down and we need my burning of energy, I'll have some fuel left. E's going to be burnt out, but I'm going to have some left as the I. And so that conservation of, of energies, whether it's metaphorical energy or, or actual real energy, that is a value to us. Uh, the, the interest in external events as an E thing, as opposed to internal reactions as an I thing. If we have that understanding, that helps us a bunch. So to review a little bit of that, uh, the people that prefer extroversion are getting their attention outside and they're interested in the world of people and things. People who prefer introversion are getting their, intent, their energy inward and they're interested in that inner world of thoughts and reflections. So the outside world of people and things is an e-thing. Inner world of thoughts and reflections is an I tendency. Uh, we, will, uh, we will see that, that people who prefer to be extrovert, uh, they, they're looking, they're attracted to the outer world. Uh, they're uh, generally quite aware of who and what's around them. They enjoy and draw energy from meeting and talking to new people. They have outward friendliness. Uh, often they talk, <laughs> uh, seem easy to get to know, uh, and and they tend to speak publicly at meetings, they'll talk, but they may not be as aware of what's going on inside of them. So they cover that up a little bit with focus on the outside. The people who prefer introversion, on the other hand, are attracted to the inner world of thoughts, feelings, and reflections, and they're usually very aware of their inner reactions, and they prefer to interact with people that they know. Uh, it's not an experiment. I don't have to figure you out. I already know you. They're often quiet in meetings. They seem uninvolved. Don't ever be fooled. The I, uh, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a book that one of the famous world poets wrote that said, every shut eye ain't asleep. And I think that's uh, a, a lesson for all of us. Every shut eye ain't asleep. And the introverts might seem uninvolved, uh, but I wouldn't bet on it. They're often reserved, harder to get to know, but they may not be as aware of what's going on outside, uh, around them. So, so we have this, this natural forces that are in tr including the outside world for extroversion, and we have these natural forces that are sucking inside uh, for the introvert. The extrovert actually feels pulled towards outward uh, events and, and, and things that are going on. Uh, the introvert feels pushed inward by what's going on. And, and that's very real. We're talking about uh, 10 zero extroverts and 10 zero introverts. Uh, as we said, they're energized by other people. Uh, and here we're saying they're energized by inner resources and internal memories and experiences and lessons learned. Uh, the Extrovert will tend to act and it may be reflect, whereas the introvert will tend to reflect and then maybe they'll act. But neither one, the act is, is, is a, a, both are not given that they have to do. Uh, the second thing is somewhat of a may, maybe. Extroverts are friendly, talkative, quick to get to know. Introverts can be reserved, quiet. It may take time to get to know the introverts. The extroverts express thoughts and emotions freely, maybe at the risk of saying too much. Introverts keep thoughts and emotions private, maybe at the risk of not saying enough. You know, so there's a little bit of downside there for, for both of us, uh, whether we're extrovert or introvert. The extrovert needs interaction with others. The introvert needs privacy. So if we're looking at people on our team and we happen to know their ease and we got them isolated in an office all by themselves, we're dooming them. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're not making, setting them up for success. On the other hand, if I've got an introverted person 
and I put them in the bullpen with all the loudmouth salesmen, and I give them a desk right in the middle of it, I'm dooming them. They need privacy. They need to be able to, to have enough uh, quiet to think because guess what? They're going to think if we let them and get put them in a situation where they can't. Yeah, the, 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 we have less to worry about the X's. People that are in the middle here, uh, by less to worry about, they're not predictable. We don't know which way they're going to go, uh, and I don't notice which language to speak. Should I speak extrovert to Ivan? Should I speak introvert to item, uh, Ivan? The good news is he's fluid in both. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. He's not, he's not irritated by either, and... He's capable in both. So a lot of us will want to drift towards the X's in all four of these, these categories because we want to have skills on the other side of the fence. you know. And, and if they're not natural skills, then we have a little bit of a handicap. Those that measure in X have natural skills in both. And, 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 and uh, uh, they become good coaches because they see both sides. We see the other guys as crazy. <laughs> you know, and so it's a little bit of a help. Did you have something to add? Oh, oh, oh okay. Uh, and, and so uh, the X's are, when I spot an X or I confirm an X in any of these temperament uh, types, uh, I immediately will reach out to them as, as a coach because they have a fluency that I don't have and, and they have a perspective that I don't have to better understand, especially if I'm trying to get a deal done I'm trying to sell an idea to somebody. We're trying to sell a package from our company to a customer or something like that. Uh, I, I will get the X's to weigh in and say, okay, you know, how, how are we doing here? I, I don't understand that other side as well as I want to. Uh, help me. And, and they were, will be able to do that. The extroverts make life wider, more inclusive. The, the introverts help us make life deeper. Uh, perhaps more meaningful in an area that matters uh, to us. Extroverts can be deemed as shallow, and introverts can be deemed as withdrawn. That's a mistake on both sides. We don't want to do that. Uh, don't, don't unfairly categorize somebody that's just not wired like I am uh, as a negative. Uh, the, uh, this is not true. They're not shallow. This is not true. They're not withdrawn. Uh, I may have forced them to seek shelter, but they're not withdrawn uh, as, as a defect. And the good news is on my team, I need, if I'm dominantly extrovert, I need eyes on my team to balance us back out. And the other way around, if I'm dominantly an I, I need extroverts on my team to help dominate, uh, balance us out. I don't want to be surprised and dominated uh, and, then, and then off balance in our team, in our business, and things that we are doing. So some words that we would see, the E words are action, outward people, interaction, many expressive, do, think, do. The introvert is ref reflection, inward privacy, concentration, few, quiet, think, do, think. And, and those are not the same uh, as far as what their tendencies are uh, to do. We all can do extroverted things and we all can do introverted things but we don't do them with equal comfort. Most of us have a preference for one over the other, uh, unless we test it as an X. And so that is the E and the I uh, that we, we, uh, we talk about. That one's kind of an icebreaker because we already knew quite a bit about that one. Let's look at the S and the N. The population on S's and N, sensing or intuition, this is how we take information in. The population on this is 75% S. One, two, three in this room. One, two, three N's in this room. The population is 50-50 in this small sampling in this room. But in the overall population, a lot more S's than there are N's. Uh, three out of four. So if we're trying to speed read somebody or guess what they are, you know, Vegas would say put the money on the S because the odds are better that the person will be an S if you don't have a clue, if you don't know uh, which they are. So what we are looking at with an S and an N, the S's draw from experience. And they draw from the past. 
They draw from what is realistic. They draw from lots of perspiration and hard work. The ends, on the other hand, draw from hunches, gut feelings, intuition. Uh, they are looking at the future much more than the S's that are drawing from the past. Uh, the ends are speculative, and instead of perspiration, the end will take a little bit of a tailwind and, and inspiration. The lucky dream that they had last night that I ought to do this. That's an in kind of a thing uh, that, that uh, uh, may have value. The S's are focused on what is actual, what really happened. The ends are focused on what's possible, what could happen. And, and those, are, those are two opposite almost uh, perspectives on stuff. The S's are down to earth and the ends are accused in some cases of having our heads in the clouds, dreamers. Uh, and in fact, you'd be surprised how many passwords I have that are woven around the word dreamer. And, and that's just bizarre uh, as I started to, to understand my temperament wiring. It's like, where did that come from? That's been with me all my life. I've, 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 I've liked not the aspect of magical dreams or uh, interpreting dreams. I wish I could, but I don't. It's just that I, I, I dream about things with my eyes open. I dream about what we could do and what we could be and what could happen. And, and, and that's just my wiring. I don't know where that came from. Uh, enough so that it now reflects in, in the in in me, the in intuitive uh, part of my natural wiring. Uh, but I've been accused to have my head in the clouds, not being realistic. And, and the S's are, are very down to earth. The S's are based on utility of something, the fact of something, the practicality of something. How sensible is this? And the ends, on the other hand, are uh, into fantasy and fiction and, and how in, ingenious is something. So ingenuity is important to an in and imagina imaginative imagination is something that the ends the you know Walt Disney was full of and, and uh, shared that uh, with enough of the world that we all got a bump from that and, and thankfully so. So this is the S in the end. If we were to look at them closer, the S's prefer to get their information from their five senses. See it, hear it, smell it, touch it, taste it, I'm in. Uh, the intuition preference is going beyond what's real and concrete and focus on what's the innuendo, what's the meaning here, what association is there between uh, those two thoughts, what are the relationships between the ideas. And, and that's something that is quite different than the sensor. And so neither is right or wrong, uh, but both of them are missing a big piece that the other has. And, and as we, we look at, we all use both, but once again, we have a comfort zone where we normally behave. People that prefer sensing like to see and collect facts and details. They are practical, realistic as we uh, converse with them and get to know them. They start at the beginning and move forward. They take one step at a time in the direction of where they're going. Uh, they don't jump around, hop around, uh, fly around. Uh, they are specific and literal when they talk, when they write, and when they listen. They, they hear what you say, and they don't, uh, they don't attach any in between the lines. Oh, I read, I read in between the lines <coughs> of what you said, and I know what you mean. No, they don't do that. They, excuse me, they take what you say as literal. They live in the present, built on what they did in the past. They deal with the here and now because of what they did in the past, and they prefer reality to fantasy. That's the censor, half of us in the room. Meet the intuitives, the other half in the room, where we look at patterns and possibilities, connections and meanings of in, in information. We're reading between the lines. We're trying to guess what they meant by that. And the S's are going, what they meant is what they said. Why is it so complicated? Uh, the ends can be conceptual and abstract. Uh, they often start anywhere, not the beginning, and they may leap over basic steps. They are the hummingbirds or the butterflies that are just all over the map. They don't go, fly in a straight line, uh, and, <coughs> and they don't see why anybody would. Uh, they speak and write in uh, metaphorical terms. These are the, 
the, the, the, the intuitives like the parables in the Bible rather than just the actual history pieces. The, the, what, the meaning behind and, and metaphorical uh, concepts are attractive to the intuitive people. They live in the future looking at the possibilities of what could be. Where are we headed next? What are we trying to do next? And we prefer imagination and ingenuity, ingenuity to reality because the truth is reality sucks, right? That's what the Nin would say. And the essence are going, well, hold on a second. We live in the reality uh, and it's quite important to us. And so these two really are different when this sequential one, two, three versus the start here and whoosh, teleport over to there. It's hard to follow a conversation with an intuitive because they could land anywhere, you know, and hang with me, stay with me. Nobody can. Uh, you just got to slow them down and say, hold on a second. I got lost there for just a second. Uh, remind me where we're at. Draw it over again. And they will. Uh, the sensors sees the individual parts and pieces, often in quite detail. The intuitive says, these pieces could fit together to be that. And, and not necessarily see the detail, just see what the big picture is going to be uh, from that pile of pieces. Both are talents, both are skills. Uh, most of us don't have both at the same time. The tendency of the sensor is to live in the present, enjoying what is here in the present, and understanding what we have in the present came because of what we did in the past and what we built that on. Whereas the intuitives... We tend to live towards the future, hoping that it could be a better place. And, you know, we see that rainbow. And I, I truly hope that rainbows haven't been ruined. I, I think our current, our current politics is damaging uh, the, the beauty of a rainbow uh, and the promise of a rainbow and what it's all about. Uh, so it's up to us to not let that happen. Uh, if you want to recognize it for both of its meanings, that's quite all right. Uh, but let's not ruin it for, uh, for, for, for me uh, if, if we don't have to. I, I think it's an awesome thing. We sometimes with the sensors are, are busy handling the practical matters while the intuitives are busy uh, thinking about what we could do next. And, and so that puts us absent in a way of the present. And on a team, this can be aggravating. While we need to know the direction of where we're going, remember the head in the clouds thing isn't very practical. The head in the clouds thing might make us go broke while we're dreaming about where we're going. And, and that's not something we really want to do. Uh, we want to get there uh, financially successfully. And so we need a whole bunch of S's that are ringing the cash register today's, today's sales and making today's sales happen. And that's, uh, um, that's, a conflict that's within a lot of organizations because when you step back for just a moment, we need both of them very badly. We can't survive without each other. And, and so understanding the role and having the right people on the right bus in the right role in the right seat, that adds more importance to this as we understand and explore temperaments. So the sensors like things that we can, that we can quantify and measure and confirm and weigh and see that it's exactly what we want, whereas the intuitives are, are looking uh, for opportunities to being uh, inventive. And when we know a few intuitives really well, uh, sometimes we see that aspect of them and, and we're amazed by it. We just don't go, how do you see all this stuff? How do you think of all this stuff? And, and, and why don't you ever follow through on any other kind of thing? Because, you know, we jump around, right? And, and so if only we could combine the strengths of the two in such a way that we get all these inventive thoughts and we then define them uh, so that they are cohesive and measurable, we have a powerful entity when we are able to do that in our organization. That's step one, two, three, four. That is, that is a plan. And that works. But if we, if we ready, fire, aim, that is an intuitive kind of thing. And uh, they don't get the sequence right a lot of times. And, and, and because we leave a step out, we got a box of parts left over, right? And, and, and we don't know quite what to do with those parts. And we know that we're sacrificing functionality of the end product because of our skipping steps. 
working hands-on with parts to understand overall design is a S thing. Uh, study the overall design to see how the parts fit together is an N thing. And I think that there's probably not much of a more powerful example of this than how do you build a duet blind? How do you manufacture that? A what? A duet, Hunter Douglas blind. blinds. You know, I don't know, duet's a trademark. You know, the folded, the folded yeah. design of, of blinds with the air pocket in the middle. Somebody said to somebody in your company, uh, we need one of those. And they go, we can do that because of this. They can study the overall design to see how parts have got to fit together. Parts that haven't been invented yet. Parts that haven't been drawn yet. Parts that haven't even been thought of yet. But how, what would they have to be in order for this thing to fold blinds? It's a pretty unbelievable challenge. And to those of us that are lesser human beings than your company, look at that and go, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I'm lost. I don't know how to do that. And so we take the talent uh, that is given sometimes with, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, unusual strength uh, on our teams. And if, we got, if we're lucky enough to have that, we can draw it out and we can do stuff that's cool because that, that talent all by itself doesn't make the machine work. That talent invents a machine, and it takes the whole rest of a bigger team to convert that to actual reality uh, and make that happen, which is kind of why we're having these conversations. The essays like using the regular stuff, the traditional solutions. The ends are okay with inventing, uh, experimenting new applications for old stuff that we haven't uh, enjoyed uh, in that way before. The essays may seem materialistic and literal minded. The intuitives may seem idealistic and impractical dreamers. Uh, we've got to tolerate each other uh, with those two things because we, we complement each other in critical ways uh, if we're allowed to do that. So if we've got a team with tall S's, we're not going to have any fun <laughs> and, and uh, uh, we're, we're going to be unbalanced and we're not going to have a growth curve. If we have a team that's all in, we're going to go broke. And, and so we need to have a balance of the two in order to have an effective company. And if you are the stronger of, the, of either one of those, then if I'm, if I'm one in, I better hire two S's you know, to, uh, to overbalance me uh, so that we are, we are on a good track and, and vice versa probably as well. Uh, so when we see that those letters, some of the words that come to our mind with the S is facts, realistic, specific, present, keep, uh, practical, what is, uh, and, and on the end, it's uh, the ideas, the imagination, the generalizations, the future, uh, change stuff, theoretical stuff, what could be, and those are opposites. And so we need a bit of both to maintain balance. Uh, Let's look at the T's and the F's. Thinkers and feelers, in this room we got one, two T's and a half, and we've got one, two, three and a half F's. Uh, the population is actually 50-50 on T's and F's. And if we were to line up, stand up, and the T's go to that wall and the F's go to this wall, uh, we'd find uh, we've got an X, Elder, is going to be in the middle. He answered those 10, 10, 10 T, 10 F answers. The rest of us answered him more one way or the other. Could be 11, 9. Uh, it could be 12, 8 uh, that we scored. It's closer and getting closer and closer to the wall. And some of us might have been 20 nothing. Uh, and in which case, we're pretty solid, pure that. Uh, but if uh, otherwise, we're something of a blend. And with the T's and the F, the T's tend to be objective at this wall. The F's on this wall are going to be subjective. The T's over there are going to be basing life on principles, policies, and laws. And over here, the F's are going to say values, social values, extenuating circumstances, maybe making it okay. The T's are going to just, it's a criteria. It's a firmness. It's like those are the rules. The F's are going, eh, um, 
maybe the art of persuasion here a little bit. Maybe I can talk you into uh, moving a little bit. Uh, and the idea of harmonizing uh, between uh, topics as opposed to just pigeonholing, just structured. It is what it is with the T. And so the F is going to uh, move around a little bit there. Uh, impersonal is kind of a T thing because it's not about them, it's about the laws. And over here, the Fs are much very personal. And, and so the Fs are interested in humaneness, whereas the Ts is just what's just, what's whatever. It is what it is. You knew ahead of time when you pulled the trigger what it was going to be. And, and, and well, you didn't mean to, you know, and, and, and whatever things like that that we would, we would see. Probably one of the things that, that the, the Ts have is the standards. The, 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 this is the exact structure. And the Fs are more uh, broad. It's like eh, good or bad uh, it, it, as opposed to being, you know, well, it's a lot of gray area. And in the Ts world, there's really no gray. It's all black and white. In the F world, there's really very little black and white. It's almost all gray. And, and it depends. It depends on, on perspective and structure and some things like that. Uh, the T is superb at critiquing. And, and in fact, a supervisor that's a T is going to view critiquing as their job. My job is to look at the plant and see what's going wrong and fix it. And I can't argue with that. In fact, that really is their job. But at the same time, the F is super strong and super good at appreciating. And the human beings in our plants, while we need critiquing, we also need appreciating. And if it's all critique and no appreciate, we burn them out. And if it's all appreciate and no critiquing, we go broke. So we have to have both. And if I've got, if I've got a... A, a, if it's up to me to hire a lead on, our, on my production team, I'm going to hire Elder because Elder has a, a, a hard wiring to be able to appreciate and at the same time critique. And the people that are really good at naturally critiquing, they just can't, they don't have a bone in them that's willing to appreciate until it's all perfect. You know, they go, well, I'll appreciate it when they get it right. You know, but right now it isn't right, and so I'm going to critique it. And 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 uh, the the people that are born all appreciating, it's like everybody doesn't get a trophy. You got to get it right, you, you know, in order to get there. And so, so the people that have natural wiring towards the middle on this that can equally appreciate and critique, that's kind of a rare combination. And I think it's a super important combination on a management team, because if it's all one or the other. We're not strong. We need critiquing, but we need kind critiquing from an appreciative point of view. And Elder, I've not seen you do it, but my money's on you because of the way you test it. Uh, I, and and, and I, I, I see that reflected in the little that I do know you so far, and I'll get to know you better as time goes by. And these are at all, all of us. I'll, I'll, we'll learn more about each other. And, 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 and these things, when we can pop something out like that and we go, oh, that's a strength that our team can really use. And then we can use that to teach the people that are too far on either wall. You know, for our company's good, we need, we need to pull... You know, the people that are on the far wall over here as Fs, we need to pull the far Ts more towards a little broader understanding of each other, uh, I think. And so this is how people make decisions. Uh, those who prefer the thinking, they base their decisions on impersonal, objective logic, very black and white. The F people make their decisions person-centered, values-based process. That's a different way of going about uh, the the process uh, and 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 they're not they're not even close to the same. People that prefer thinking will use logic to analyze a problem, uh, to assess the pros and cons. They focus on the facts and principles. So far, that's a good thing. They're good at analyzing the situation. They focus on problems and tasks, but not the relationships. And you can't ignore the relationships. We may not include the impacts on people are people's emotions in their decision making. All right, this leads us into trouble. Uh, unnecessary trouble because all of this stuff we read about at the beginning is critical. That's important, it's, it's vital 
for us to have that. But then when we get to this spot, we get into quicksand. The people who prefer feeling, uh, they use their personal values to understand a situation. They focus on the values of the group or the organization. They're good at understanding people and their viewpoints. They concentrate on relationships and harmony, but <laughs> uh, they have a tendency to overlook logical consequences of individual decisions of how that's going to fit into the organization. And so now they get into the quicksand. <clears throat> and so we once again uh, need uh, a, a dose of both. Thinkers make decisions by stepping back from the situation and trying to get an objective view. Objective view means not biased by things. Very, ob very objective uh, is, is factual stuff. The F makes a decision by stepping into the situation, taking an empathetic point of view. You got to walk a mile in their shoes concept of get close to it, to understand it from their point of view. Two different places to make a decision from. Uh, two different, different styles of making a decision. Uh, two different places and gives us different answers. The thinker decides with their head, thankfully. Uh, the feeler decides with their heart. Again, thankfully. We, we need both. Uh, the, there are some schools of thoughts that, that make this an interesting piece, just this piece all by itself. The Japanese and a lot of Eastern cultures believe that all sales decisions are made in the gut. Not the heart, but the gut. Uh, and that's just that, what the Japanese call it because it's somewhere in there that's not in our brain. And, and so they, they say that all marketing, all marketing does is get your brain filled up with enough facts to let you agree with what your gut assessed in the first place. Saying in practical terms, the Toyota people, which is where I learned this, the Toyota people say, it does not matter how, many, uh, how much torque your pickup truck has, it does not matter what size horsepower and how big a boat it can tow, the towing capacity of your truck. Those are all data points for your brain to log in and file and then you're going to buy the truck you like <laughs> in here. And, 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 and so that may help you like the truck if you're, if you're far a thinker. It gives your thinker some data that you can go, okay, we made this logical decision and you can deny that you bought the truck you liked. But the Japanese say, no matter what, no matter what your temperament type is actually, you still buy the truck you like. You buy the, the purchasing decisions in the gut. I don't know if they're right or wrong. I, I've read others that have adopted that, that thought process. I think there's some truth to it in my life. My life. Uh, I don't know about yours, and I don't know about others from large groups of people, uh, but I think that there's value to that for my world, understanding that the people, if I, I'm trying to sell them anything, not, I'm not a truck, but you know, an idea, uh, that they have to like the idea in their heart. And, and, and that may be true of even the people that are that are pure thinkers. Uh, I don't know. I'm just throwing that in as a point counterpoint on this concept. Thinkers' tendency of going by logic. Uh, feelers' tendency to go by personal convictions. Thinkers are concerned with principles like truth and justice, black and white. Uh, the feelers are concerned with values like relationships and harmony and getting along uh, and sacrificing sometimes a little bit in order to get along. Thinkers see others as an onlooker from outside a situation. Uh, feelers see things as a participant from within a situation. Thinkers are taking a long-range view. The feelers are climbing into the forest uh, to get a personal, immediate personal view, wanting to see, uh, can't see the forest for the trees. That's an F thing. They get close enough that that's all they see both. Uh, the T's will back off so they can get the big picture and see that. Talked about critiquing and appreciating. And, and uh, that is really one of the features of a T and an F that we can, we can uh, groom and we can uh, benefit from and we can help them teach. It is important that all of the Fs on the team spend some time with a T who can teach them how to critique. The Fs don't like to critique and we need to. We need to kindly critique, but we need to critique 
and said, I didn't want to say anything because yeah, it wasn't that big a deal. That means you should have said something. That's what it means. Uh, and so uh, we, we need that teaching if we are, have a team with Fs on it. And, and we need also with the Ts, we need a dose of somebody that's an F that can teach the Ts how to appreciate. And, and appreciating is something that the Ts are very hesitant to do. They think it's endorsing bad behavior. It's not. Uh, you can appreciate somebody that's half done. You can appreciate somebody that hasn't fished, finished the triathlon yet, but they're at mile 10, and you can appreciate them and root them on. Uh, they're not done. No celebration. They don't get a trophy yet. No. But they're participating and they're trying, and, and we need some appreciation of those individuals uh, to make them want to finish in, in our workplace. The T's are good at, great at analyzing plans. Uh, the F's are great at understanding the whipsaw effect of people. There are deals that go south all the time, all around us, because people don't like each other. There are people, you put your house on the market, on the general market, and somebody offers cash, and if you don't like them, you won't sell them your house. Why not? You agreed on a price, they were going to bring you the money. But there's something that we get indignant. At what, no, I don't want them to buy the house because, you know, they're, they're going to put a, you know, a puppy mill in the backyard, whatever. You know, we take a position on it. And I've seen uh, that happen a lot. So we have to have uh, the plans analyzed and the cause and effect, the whipsaw of the people relationship. The thinkers might seem distant or condescending to others. The feelers might seem too involved, uh, too close, too emotionally attached uh, to others. And, and those can both be viewed as problematic, <clears throat> or those can really both be viewed, viewed as a strength if we understand them uh, uh, from elsewhere on the team. If we've got all feelers and no T's, uh, we got a problem. If we are all T's and no feelers, uh, we got a problem. And so either way, we need the other uh, for balance, just like we've said before. Uh, the, the, the list of things that you can scan through there that describe the T's, that describe the F's, are similar to what we've talked about with the other letters. We need both. And, and it's nice when we identify the X's that can do both uh, and, and uh, are able to learn from them. Now we're left with the last two that is where we cause fights. <laughs> These two is where we get mad at each other. Uh, fact of the matter is, I, I just remembered this, and let me see if I've still got it in this handout that you've got. I had a little thing I included here one time. Yeah, let's read this together just as a pause for a second. Go to page six in your handout. Uh, does everybody still have a handout? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to set this down for one second and go uh, turn the lights up so we can read this small fuzzy print. Okay. This is when we fight. <laughs> Um, a lot of times when we disagree with others and we have conflict, a lot of times that conflict is really because we, didn't, we forgot uh, the differences in our personality and we forgot that the other person is, has been blessed with a temperament that's different than ours and right now it's a little irritating, but all in all we usually think of it as a good thing, but right this moment we forgot it. Uh, and so this is just a... A, a little bit of, of uh, the, if you're one and, and, and you're dealing with the other, uh, a couple things that are of value. But I, the, 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 the money is in the, the judges and perceivers at the very bottom of this. But let's, let's read this by paragraph. Uh, you pick up the extrovert, uh, read that, then the, then the next person read the introvert part, next person read the censor, next person read the intuitive. We'll go around the room twice that way and we'll read these things. Start with Melissa. Extroverts, stop, look, and listen. You may think you can talk your way through and out of most conflicts. The very th 
thing you find most difficult is what may be needed most, listening to the other person's point of view. So extroverts, stop and listen. And you got to laugh at that because if you're extroverted, you know that's a problem. Next one, introverts. Um, introverts, express yourself. As difficult as it, it often is, and as much as it seems redundant, it is imperative that you tell your side of the story and maybe even tell it again until the other person has heard it. For the conference concerned, a little overkill can help. Make sure you are, make sure you get a hearing. So, so don't shut down uh, if you're naturally wired as an introvert. There's a time and place where it would benefit everybody if you just step up. Express yourself. Okay, what about the sensors? Sensors. There's more to conflict than just the facts. Sometimes, though it seems to you to be a waste of energy that, that clouds the issue, look at... Ex extenuating. Extenuating, sorry, I thought it was an extenu Extenuating circumstances. If someone always disagrees with you, no matter what you say, there may be issues involved that need attention other than just the situation of the moment. Okay. Intuitives? Stick to the issues. When conflict arises, you want to relate it to the total picture. That's not always appropriate or helpful. It clouds the specifics and complicates resolution. Sometimes it helps just to settle a simple dispute, which then allows you to deal with the bigger issue. Okay. There's a couple of good pieces of advice there <clears throat> for whichever we are in S or an N. Now let's look at the thinkers and feelers. So thinkers, Melissa. Allow some genuine expressions of emotion. You become unglued when others cry at work. You are similarly uncomfortable when people hug or express warmth. But these emotions at work or anywhere else are integral in conflict resolutions. Even if you're able to express these things yourself, allow others the freedom to do so. So I think that that's just hilarious. The thinkers, if you're a pure thinker, that statement, you become unglued when others cry at work. And I, I've seen people do just that. Okay, the feelers. Uh, feelers be direct and competitive. The world won't come to an end if you say something you really mean, even if it's negative. What, should, uh, what sounds harsh to you, probably even repeat as harshly by other types. They're probably even appreciate and respect your frankness. If you are given to... If you are given to expressing a lot of emotion, don't apologize or feel guilty for doing so. Being upfront about your feelings affiliates moving to constructive resolution. Okay, so spit it out <laughs> if you're the feeler. All right, we're now looking at the two that I think is just uh, uh, special. Uh, let's look at judges versus perceivers. see the world as black and white, right and wrong, and, it, and have difficulty accepting opposing points of view. It's hard to negotiate with someone who thinks he or she is always right. That's just hilarious, and the more we get to know judges, we know that that's a tendency. Perceivers. Take a clear position. Perceivers can often argue both sides because they truly see both sides of an argument. Sometimes it comes from in the form of playing devil's advocate. While flexible and adaptive, it's not always helpful to resolving a problem. It may even intensify the dispute. If you really feel strongly about something, take a stand and defend it. Perceivers just uh, find that hard to do. And I think that's kind of an, an amusing little article. Uh, while we're open to the pages, though, let, let me point out a couple more things to you. Uh, let's, uh, the page right before it, page five. I was kind of referring to this page when we were introducing the letters, and we're right now at the spot of introducing the judger and perceiver. So look at the bottom uh, quartile of this page. Uh, I photocopied this out of that book uh, that, I, that I referred to, please understand me. And this is, the J's and the P's are 50-50 in population, and, and if I were to look at this room, we are heavily J, uh, not, uh, not as many P's. And in, in corporate management, that's almost always the case. The P's are very underrepresented. 
The Jays are very over heavily represented. Uh, not overly, they're competent and capable. Um, but uh, there's more Jays than you'd expect with a distribution of 50-50 in the population. So if you follow along with me, you'll see some of the differences. If we, if we lined up in the room and put the J's on that wall over there and the P's on this wall over here and the, the X's in the middle if we had any and, and distributed accordingly, you would, you would, we would say the J's tend to be settled, decided, fixed. They plan ahead. They run their life. On this side, the P's it's pending. We gather more data. We're flexible. We adapt as we go. We let life happen. Uh, the, the J's like closure. They like decision making. They like stuff to be planned and completed. The P's, uh, we, we adapt as we go. Let life happen. There's open options. There's treasure hunting. It's open-ended. We'll see when we get there. Uh, things are emergent as opposed to completed on the J side, decisive on the J side, uh, emergent on the P side, tentative on the P side. On the J side, wrap it up. P's are going, eh, something will turn up. J's are going, urgent, this is urgent. P's are going, eh, there's plenty of time. J's are going, deadline, and we're going, what deadline? I don't know about no stinking deadline. You know, that's a P answer. Get the show on the road. Uh, let's wait and see. P's will drive the J's crazy. And if there's conflict in between husband and wife, often we can go back and we can see one's a J, one's a P. Not always. I mean, conflict is capable everywhere. Uh, we just are human beings that are wired to conflict with each other sometimes. But the J and the P is an area where we really don't get each other. And, and until we spend some time explaining, we really can have problems there. So looking at the judges, they want the external word, world to be organized and orderly. They look at the world and they see the, all these decisions that need to be made. And if you're a J, you're looking at that and going, yeah, I get it. The P's are seeking to experience the world, not organize it. And the P's look at the world and see options that need to be explored. The J's look at the world and see decisions that need to be made to change it. And the P's are more uh, uh, accepting of, of, of it as it is. And, and that, that's not a feature or a benefit or a handicap or a hazard. That is just the way we're wired. And those two ways are widely different. People who prefer judging, they like to make plans and then follow them. Don't mess with the plans even by 10 minutes with a J. They like to get things settled and finished. They want the check mark, check it off. The app on the cell phone that gives you a to-do list with crossouts that is made for the J. They like environments with structure. They like limits, actually. They enjoy being decisive, being the man in charge or the person in charge. And, and they, they like uh, organizing the troops. The Jays are awesome at getting the kids ready for church on Sunday morning. The, J, the kids hate them, but the Jays can get it done. And sometimes uh, that's hard to do, I know, uh, to get the kids ready for church on Sunday morning. Uh, the, the Jays are very, very good with deadlines and time limits. In fact, that helps them get things done. They'll drop it in, schedule it, and it'll happen. Uh, they plan ahead because they hate last-minute rushes. If you're a P, you're looking at this and going, this is not me. But none of you are P's. I am. I'm looking at that and going, that is not me. Here's me. Uh, I like to respond resourcefully to changing situations. That means no plans. <laughs> that means we'll figure it out. Uh, they like to leave things open, gather more information. We're going to Springdale. What are we going to do? I don't know. We're going to Zion. What are you going to do? I don't know. Uh, we're going to hike the one that nobody else is hiking, whatever that is. But I don't know now until I get there, and we'll decide then. Uh, they like environments that are flexible, dislike rules and limits. Uh, if you have a P in your world, and they're 50-50, so we do, understanding that we don't like rules and limitations, that's a problem. And if you've got a teenager that's a P, the same wiring is there. 
That's a problem. That's a parenting challenge. Uh, we got to overcome that problem. It's not just okay to allow it, right? We have to, we have to grow uh, that which is a problem. It's a limitation uh, that will, will, will keep us from accomplishing what we want. The peas may not like making decisions even when pressed. That for sure is me. I've talked about it in this class before. When I have a team, when I'm a boss, when, I, uh, it, when it's my group, my company, my organization that's on the line, one of the first things I have to do is I have to explain to the team who I am. And who I am is, I'm going to make you crazy. I'm not going to make decisions as fast as you want them made. And, and that's not okay in business. It means we, we lose opportunity. I don't want to be that way. But I am that way. So what I have to do is I have to put a bunch of J's around me and give them permission to help me pull the trigger, to help me say, okay, we got to do this. We're losing opportunity. We got enough information, Steve. Okay, okay, take a deep breath. Let's do it. And, and, and I'll, I'll still go home at night and look it up and see if you're right. But you know, I, 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 I need help in getting all enough information to make decisions. It's not like I'm not capable of making a decision. It's just there's always more information than I think I need before I can make a decision. And, and in, in business, uh, we get swept by if we live our life that way. Uh, Napoleon was that way. Napoleon, and not, not that I'm like Napoleon, I, I, I hope and it'd be nice in some ways if I was, and I hope in other ways that I'm not. Uh, but Napoleon had a, had a uh, a theory. I had an ancestor who was on his team, and and uh, uh, there's written stories about some of the things about the way he led. And and if you brought something to Napoleon for a decision, he often said, "Take it back, come back in six months, and we'll see if it's still a problem." And and he would not. He would defer decisions for months, literally, uh, consciously, uh, put it off take it back. He'd tell them he was deferring it, but it, it wasn't always so they would figure it out so that he didn't have to do it. It was that he didn't want it. His temperament was a strong P, you know, and, and it, was, it was exhibited in his brilliant generaling. Um, he often got to a battle and didn't know what he was going to do. He didn't have the strong battle plans. He went to Russia without enough food and it cost him, you know, and, and he needed a bunch more J's to plan that trip or he needed Travelocity or something. I don't know uh, what it was, but Waterloo took him down because of him being a strong perceiver. And, and when we, we see disasters like that that occur because of a flaw in a temperament that was uncorrected, it's not that it was a flaw uh, uh, individually, it was that the team didn't, he was, wasn't given permission to balance out. Because we all have temperament issues that could cost us the farm, good or bad. All of us have them. And, and so we need to know that and then put the team around us that keeps us from doing the stupid stuff. And, and with me, uh, that's, that's one for me in running a company. Tend to think there's plenty of time to do things, often have to rush to complete things at the last minute. I am the night before guy. You know, and I'll do a real good job of it, but I may not get to go to bed. I may have to stay up all night. And, and I'm generally okay with that because for me, the counterbalance of why am I that way is because it's fresh in my mind now. I didn't prepare this class three weeks ago where I've forgotten all about it. I prepared this last night. And so it's fresh in my mind and I feel like an, I, I can do better, but the Jays look at me and go, you're just crazy and I want to kill you. And, 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 uh, and, and I get the difference, and I understand the aggravation or the irritation that that difference means. Where it, I think I've shared this with you guys before. Uh, when I travel, I often don't make reservations, and the J's in my life just freak out. It's like, you're going, where? Where are we staying? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? We're flying to New York, and you don't know where? New York's got a lot of hotel rooms. And unless there's the Grand Prix of Monaco in New York that day, there's going to be hotel rooms available. I do check to see if there's big events. If there's big events, I understand that towns sell out. I've had that happen because <laughs> I went there without reservation. So I know firsthand. But, but there's a why I don't want reservations for me. And for the Jays, it doesn't overweigh it. Jay still wants a reservation. But for me, the why is 
I don't know what, I'm, what time I'm going to get there, and I don't know what I'm going to want to do at that hotel because I don't know what time I'm going to get there. My meeting is tomorrow morning at 8. I, I'm flying into town tonight. I should arrive at the hotel at 5, 6 o'clock. Flight's supposed to do, be in at 3. So if that happens, I want a hotel that's nice. I want a hotel that's got a gym. I want a hotel that's got a good restaurant. Probably want a hotel that's got a bar. I, I, I want some stuff to do at that hotel. I want it to be in a nice neighborhood because it'll be daylight when I get there. I want to enjoy the, 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 the neighborhood, the area. Um, but if my flight's late, which it could be, and I arrive at midnight, I don't want to pay for this nice hotel. I want Motel 6 with a clean pillow and a where I can crash for five hours, get up, and, and go to my meeting. And, and that's all I want. And I, and, and I also want a decent neighborhood. Now, Motel 6 don't, don't tend to be in real decent neighborhoods, but uh, uh, I tend to stay maybe one step above that, you know, the Holiday Inn or Hamptons or one of those kinds of places. But have you ever made reservations at a hotel and when you got there, it looked nothing like the picture online? Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow, I go, where did they get this picture from? Was there one room that was nice in this hotel yeah. and they took a picture of it and I got this one and that wasn't the one, you know? Or, or, and there's, 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 there's a, you know, there's a, 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 a crack grocery store in the, on the curb right in front of the hotel, you know, and, and I don't, I, I, I don't, when, if I arrive at a hotel like that, and I've already paid the reservations, I paid, I bought that hotel room. I'm staying there that night, unless it's so scary that I go ahead, I'm going to pay for two hotel rooms tonight, and I'm going somewhere else. And that's happened to me, and I don't want that to happen to me. If I get there and I've, I, I, I don't want to have reservations and go, you got to stay here now. I want to bail. I want to tell the Uber guy to take me to the better side of town and find me a hotel room. And, and, and they, often, they often will. And, and so that's why I'm the way I am. But that still doesn't make the Jay comfortable with going without reservations. So we'll have a little fight. Uh, and and, and uh, I may win the fight or I may concede to it's not a good idea uh, to go to Europe without a hotel reservation. Probably ought to have one. Uh, and and I'm, 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 I'm somewhat okay with compromise here on this. Uh, but, but this idea of being a chronic rusher to complete things at the last minute, when I recognize a P on my team, I know that's a problem. So I usually have pseudo deadlines, right? We have preliminary deadlines so that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna make a presentation internally a week before we have to make it to the client so that, that we, we can see what the company's proposal is going to be and the J's can help us get it right because the P's going to hold off to the last minute and if we find out that their line of thinking wasn't what we wanted it to be until the night before we're making our proposal, we're screwed. And so we protect ourselves based on known behaviors that the judges and procedures are going to do. The Jays like this planned approach to meeting the deadline in a scheduled way. The perceiver is much more like this, buzzing around, buzzing around, doing nothing, and then all of a sudden, comes skidding in sideways, tongue hanging out, barely got it done. <coughs> and sometimes that means you didn't spell check, and that's a problem. Uh, the J's like an organized lifestyle. The P's like a a uh, uh, a more uh, <coughs> pardon me flexible way of going about things. And I think we can see that when we look at the glove box in their car, <laughs> we can tell a J from a P uh, always. Uh, the the J's like definite order and structure. The P's like going with the flow, whatever the way the wind is blowing or the crowd is moving. The J's like to have things under control. P's like to experience life as it happens. J's like being decisive, and that means in control. Uh, the P's are okay with uh, discovering surprises, and they value curiosity. And I, I, I value curiosity because I'm a P, and and there are, it's often there are those that that are around us that are so curious they're annoying and and so we have to understand if that's their wiring how can we leverage that curiosity 
to a feature that benefits our team. And, and sometimes that's, that's an important part of leadership is getting this person on the right seat on our bus. Because they're not going to stay sitting down that long. They're ADHD, first of all. And so we've got to, and by, by the way, that was, I just made that up. That's not true. ADHD has nothing to do with temperament type. ADHD is spread evenly across all temperament types. Um, but that's, that reflects, you can give a false diagnosis of ADHD, I think, uh, with the P's. Uh, that clear limits and categories is a J feature. Freedom to explore without limits is a P thing. Feels comfortable closing the door on stuff in a J. The, the P's don't. Uh, they feel comfortable with maintaining options. So we can always go back out that door again if we had to. Don't close it. You know, don't, don't sell that yet because I'm not using it now, but I might. So it sits in the garage for a while uh, before I finally realize it's been five years and I still haven't used it, so probably I won't. Uh, so close it, you know. Uh, the Jays get their work done in advance as it fits their schedule. P's are always at a, at a mad dash uh, at last minute uh, and often late uh, as a result of it because they don't care about the time factor quite as much as the J does. The J may seem demanding, rigid, and uptight. The P may seem disorganized, messy, and irresponsible. And those perceptions are both founded, uh, and we have to manage that if, if we are one or the other. If we have all J's on our bus, once again, it will not be a party bus, and it won't have, it won't have any fun. Um, uh, but, and, but we'll be business-like uh, and maybe profitable. Uh, over here, if we got all P's on the bus, uh, we may go broke. Uh, and we may not have the structure or the discipline as a company to achieve what we need to achieve. And so I got to have a blend of both of those on my team or else we aren't going to be as, as successful as we could be. I got to have that balance. So does that make some sense as we look at the four uh, individual pairs of, of uh, letters? Now, when we put them all together, we get... Uh, a personality type, one of 16 personality types that is going to look like this. And when we put an X in there, uh, what it means is that uh, if you're an, an, an ISXJ, you got to find the IXFJ and the IX uh, and the ISTJ, wherever that one is. ISTJ, IS, right there, next to it, ISTJ. So, you have to read two of those blocks if you've got an X in your temperament, but it's not so definitive because you're equally comfortable with the, in this case, the F or the T, if that's where it's at. Uh, so we have a lot of descriptions of what these four letters can mean in, in um, uh, combination, but from my point of view, why we've done this isn't for self-awareness for ourselves, which by the way, it is a critical step if we're going to study emotional intelligence ever on your own. Uh, one of the foundations, there are four principles of, of emotional intelligence, and the very first one is on the basis of self-understanding. And so kind of understanding who we are and how we are, uh, both intellectually and, and emotionally, uh, and, and uh, 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 that's the foundation that we build everything on. So this, this goes into that. Uh, uh, beneficially for us. Understanding for me that everybody else is not wired like I am. Uh, that is a huge life discovery that we keep rediscovering. We just expect people to draw the same conclusions we do, and they don't, they won't, they never will. Uh, they are f filtering things through a different set of filters than we are, and, and so we have to have uh, some understanding of that. What I want to look at next is these combinations and and kind of how we can we can uh, we can connect or or detect and and I think that that there's some stuff here that you have in your handout about how to connect and how to how these people you know what their favorite office setting is how they work best based on what they are what I want us to do right now. Uh, is shift the topic to, let me find where we're at, uh, where I want to talk. Let me, 
Well, it's 5 o'clock. I think where I'm at, where we want to talk, is time for a break, first of all. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, let's take a break, and I'll find a spot where we're going to land, because uh, we're going to look at speed reading. How do we read somebody without giving them the test? So that's where we'll, we'll pick up after break. So we'll see you back in 10 minutes or so.